And uh, our goal, if all works as we're planning it out to, we will end John when we celebrate Easter this year. So we do have a, an end in sight in that. But we've enjoyed focusing there and took a little break over Christmas time and at the beginning of this year uh, focusing on what the church is and should be and enjoyed that. But I uh, just want to make mention of something that uh, when we think about what John is all about, we've mentioned this before, but there really is a key passage that explains that for us. And this is great when there's passages in Scripture that very clearly say, this is what this means, or this is why it's here for, um, and we have one of those in John. And hopefully you remember this verse, but in John 20, verses 30 and 31, we have the whole point of the book of John. This is why John, the writer, wrote this. John 20, 30 and 31, uh, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole point of John, that everything we have in this gospel is written so that we may know that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Savior, he is our Messiah, and that by believing, grabbing a hold of that, which pastor was just saying, that that's where we find our hope and our joy and our satisfaction, we can have life salvation. So that's the point of why we've been focusing here. If you notice, uh, our cross wasn't here before. The cross, we kind of had it tucked away along the back wall uh, back before Christmas time, and that's kind of where it was at. Um, if we're honest, it's kind of obnoxious. It is there. There's no denying that that cross is right in center stage when you come into this church. And uh, we, we did that purposefully. Okay, and the point of that is that as we, again, jump back into John as we finish this out, the last three chapters, 18, 19, 20, 21, so four chapters, the focus really is the cross. The focus for the remainder of the book of John is on the death of Jesus and his resurrection. And I just interesting, and I don't think it's by coincidence that we're going to be in Leviticus for a little while, and we're going to focus on all of those sacrifices. And Pastor brought this up, but I've been kind of wrestling with this the last two days as I've been reading through Leviticus just how graphic that would have been for the people in the Old Testament. How graphic that would have been to take an animal to a priest and have him slaughter that animal because you messed up. You violated one of God's laws. When you're aware of that, the only way for that sin to be covered for a time is for an animal to take your place through its death. Think about the graphic nature of that. You think about how I don't think you could really get callous of that. We don't want to dive into that too deeply because that is pretty graphic, but at the same time, that pointed to the fact that sin is a serious thing and it had to be dealt with. There's a cost associated with that. And that was the case for Israel all the way through the Old Testament. We see uh, going into when Jesus enters the picture, that was still the situation. When Jesus comes and what he does on the cross deals with that. Not just for a sin, but for all sin. That is just such an important thing. And so we want to focus and have our attention be on the fact that it really is about the cross. It's about what Jesus has done and what that accomplished for us. Pastor, let's talk about that. Thank you, Marcus. Great, great way to just launch us back into the Gospel of John. And we realize that these concluding chapters really are driving us to the cross. And that, that's really John's point and his objective at this moment. Uh, the remaining chapters, in a sense, you know, we've kind of got the, 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 the post story, the epilogue, but these remaining chapters are really take place in a matter of hours now. A couple days at the most, as we see that burial and three days later the resurrection. And it's all focused there, and these things are going to, to unfold very quickly. And as we drive there, and Marcus was right, we're, if everything works well, and it seldom does work well, um, we're going to uh, we're going to talk about the resurrection on resurrection morning, as we just kind of work our way through these remaining chapters. But as we do that, I, I also want to back up a little bit. As we kind of get back into John, we left off right at the beginning of chapter 18. We're not going to look at that this morning. We want to back up. In, in fact. 
we want to be reminded that all of these events are taking place at the time of Passover. And that's significant. It wasn't just a coincidence or an amazing coincidence. It, it's significant that these things are taking place at Passover. In fact, if you would just open your Bibles briefly to John in chapter 13, there's just one phrase here. We're going to go to... Uh, we're going to go to Exodus eventually. But in John chapter 13, John introduces that part of his narrative with these words. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart of this world to his Father, having loved his own whom, whom were with him in the world. He loved them to the end. And really, as John's saying, this, these are the final moments of Jesus loving his disciples, loving his followers, because now everything that's happening is is about Passover, and it's all been leading to this. Marcus was right when he said um, the theme of John is that verse, these things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. But there are secondary themes that are woven throughout the Gospel of John, and one of those secondary themes is this idea that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. And, and we have those themes and those hints and those indications. And very early in the Gospel of John, we have that theme coming in. We're, we're heading towards Exodus, but before you get to Exodus, go back to John in chapter 1. Remember how this was played out for us, how this was described for us. In early in Jesus' public ministry, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, who's different than John the writer of the Gospel, John the Baptist was going before Jesus, he was preaching, he was preaching repentance, he was baptizing, and the religious leaders of the time wanted to know what he was about. And so in chapter 1, in round about uh, verse 24, they send a delegation, the religious leaders send a delegation to John the Baptist, really wanting to know what, what is he preaching and what is he about, and in fact, is he claiming to be the Messiah, because there had been many who claimed to be the Messiah. John's answer, John the Baptist's answer is, I'm not the one, but the one who comes after me. And now this is my loose paraphrase. The one who comes after me, he's the one that you need to pay attention to. And then, at verse 29, John makes this statement. It says, the next day, he, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, when we were there months and months ago, we, we kind of talked about, well, what does that mean? What did John say, and did he know everything that he was saying at that point? Did he understand everything that he was saying when he said, behold, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Did John know that he would be the sacrifice? Did John know, and was he in his mind equating that with the whole Old Testament law and the law of the sacrifice and the and, and the penalty for sin, did he have that understanding? I don't know, it's debatable to, to know if he knew that or not. I'm pretty confident that John wasn't using this as saying, you know, what a lamb. That guy, what a sweet and gentle man is that Jesus. You know, he's just a lamb. Be a lamb. Isn't he a sweet guy? I'm sure that's not what he had in mind. I'm sure that somewhere in that thinking and certainly in the prompting of the Holy Spirit to cause John to make that statement, we have to go all the way back to the Passover lamb, the lamb of God. So now, here's where I want you to go, to, to Exodus in chapter 12. Exodus in chapter 12, we have that, that account of Passover, and we'll set the scene again for you. Remember, uh, the, the descendants of Abraham have been in Egypt for now 400, 500 years. They... They have multiplied, they are numerous, and yet they are enslaved in Egypt. Life is bitter for them. They've cried out to God. God is sent to deliver in Moses. Moses has gone before Pharaoh several times now, ten times now, saying, you've got to let him go. And each time Pharaoh hardens his heart, and then there is a plague that comes upon them. Well, now we are about to see that final plague, that final judgment. And it's the judgment that death is going to pass through the land of Egypt. And God makes a provision for them. And this is God's instruction for Moses to instruct the people about what this provision is going to be. So in Exodus, in chapter 12, we begin reading here. 
Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you, and it is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all of the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now, if, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbors nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. And they are to divide the lamb. And your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats, and you will keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight go on from there, but you know, we just see God's provision in that. It's interesting that we read that, and maybe one of the questions that would come up is, why why change the months here? Did you notice that? Back in verse 2, God says, this month will be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year. In essence, God is, is changing the calendar. Now, he's establishing that Hebrew calendar for them. But more than just making them different, there's a couple things that we could take away from this. And one is this, that maybe we, we just understand that God says, this is a new beginning. This is going to start a new season for you. This is a new era for you. This is a new beginning for you. And I'm going to show you how this new beginning is going to work. I'm going to show how this new relationship is going to unfold for you. And this is going to be the beginning of things. But even in that, maybe we would take that a step farther and say that what God is indicating here is this is the reference point. I want you to start numbering your year according to this month and these events. I want you to look back at this because this is the reference point. Everything starts here. And everything that you're going to celebrate in the year starts here. It has its foundation here. Everything that you are and everything that you do has its foundation here. This is foundational really is foundation. He gives an instruction that they are to take a lamb. Each household take a lamb. And then he gives that little, he gives that little instruction that uh, if, if your house isn't big enough for a lamb, you can share one with your neighbor. An interesting provision. Maybe God is just reinforcing this fact that everybody is expected. Everybody is accountable. No one is exempt, but nobody is excluded. No one's exempt, but no one is excluded. But he tells them to take a lamb. Let's focus there for a minute. Take this lamb. Set it apart. Set it apart. It's got to be a lamb without blemish. And, and we, we may know what that means if, if you spend you know, some time in, in old, the Old Testament and then comparing that to the New Testament. You might come to this understanding that to be without blemish, really this is talking about being without sin because God is just beginning to paint this whole picture of the consequences of sin and the sacrifice for the sin and deliverance from sin. And so what you need is something that is unblemished. You need one without sin. And so the picture of this lamb without sin is a lamb is the sacrifice. A lamb without blemish is a sacrifice without sin. But we get ahead of ourselves there. Maybe we just take that really simply. That God is laying the groundwork for the people about what is to come. And he's saying, this has got to be, it's got to be a worthwhile sacrifice. It can't be a cheap sacrifice. Don't bring me a, a lame lamb. Don't bring me something that is sick and diseased. Don't bring me something that's going to die anyway. By the way, later in Israel's history, they fell into that pattern right at the end of the Old Testament. God says, I'm hating your, your sacrifice because you're bringing me the sick and the diseased and the lame. And they kind of adopted this attitude that, well, it's going to die anyway. It's not any good to us. Let's go give it to the Lord. God's pattern from the very beginning is this is not a cheap sacrifice. And when we read, bring an unblemished lamb, I think we can read into that, bring me the best of the flock. The one that is the strongest. The one that has the most potential, the one is the, that is the most dear to you economically, this is the one that you bring. And you're to set it apart. Set it apart because in this moment, this one is different. Now, we don't know um, how they kept it separate. 
There, some Bible scholars say that it was just kept in a separate pen or kept away from the rest of the flock. Some say that it's, you actually bring it into the house for these days, these four or five days from the 10th to the 14th, bring it into the house. What, what would happen if you brought a lamb into your house? Kids are going to get a little bit attached to it pretty quickly. It's going to be set apart. It's going to be recognized that this one is different. Even if it was, if it was set apart in a different pen and set apart from the rest of the, the flocks, you would begin to think of it differently. But this one is different. This one is special. This one is significant. This one has a special purpose. It's different. From those days, the 10th to the 14th, that truth becomes real. So it makes this next step a little more shocking. We read it in verse 6. The Lord says, You shall keep it until the 14th day. So 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th at twilight. In the same, uh, the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Now, I just wonder what that was like. I, I appreciate Mark is just talking about the sacrifice in, in the Old Testament and just the routine of that. It never became commonplace. They were never callous to that. Uh, I just in our reading, we see it over and over again. When they brought the sacrifice, they had to lay their hand on it. It became personal. This is my sin. This is for me. This is my transgression that's being paid for. It was personal. But can you imagine in this setting that you've brought this lamb into your family, into the household, and the children have become attached to it? It's been set apart. You know that this one is special. And the whole congregation, this isn't something that's done in the back room so it doesn't gross out the kids. It's the whole congregation is involved in this. You're to kill the lamb. This lamb has been part of the family long enough for an emotional attachment to be made. It's a sacrifice that is meaningful. It's a sacrifice that is significant. And then with that sacrifice. There is, and I call it just the ugly application of that. Then God gets to what he really was, was driving to. Here's the ugly application. We read it in verse 7 and following. Moreover, they are take, to take some of the blood and put it on the two, two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat its flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs not eat any of it raw or boiled. But it gives that application that the blood is to be applied, and that becomes significant. It's an ugly application. You know, I, I wonder at this point if, if they heard that and said, well, this is, this is really strange, this is odd. We've never done this before. There's no indication in Scripture, there's no indication in, in historical records that anything like this has ever been done. This is not a common practice. This is unusual. This is different. And they had to apply that to the frame of their door. And when we think about that, realize this is not a decorative application. There's nothing decorative about this. There's, there's nothing beautiful about this. It's ugly. It's blood. And think about how, how that works and how that looks. Um, you know, that, that fresh red blood applied to the frame of the door quickly dries and from fresh red to dark brown to black. And I wonder with every household doing that if that odor also was included with that. There's a stench of blood. There's a stench of death. It's an ugly application. And in that ugly application of the blood, I'm sure that it was offensive to some. I'm sure that some took offense to that. Maybe some in Israel... Maybe, uh, certainly their neighbors took offense to that. Now, can you imagine just the ridicule that takes place at that moment as the neighbors are offended by that application? What are they doing? Those Hebrews, they're crazy. Look at what they've done. Every one of them smeared blood. It's so ugly. Why have they done that? They've desecrated their houses. Who would live there? Who would do that? And they were ridiculed for that. For that. I wonder, and this is just my imagination, but I wonder if any of the Hebrews hesitated at this moment. Did any of them hear that instruction and say, we can go along with the sacrifice. Sacrifice is not that uncommon. We do that from time to time. We understand doing a sacrifice. 
And we're all for having a special ceremonial meal. We're all for the, the, the meaning of that ceremony. We're all for that. But this blood thing, I can't get over that blood thing. It's just, it's too extreme. I wonder if any of the Hebrews said, you know, we'll do everything up to that point. But I've worked too hard on my house to smear it with blood. I, I don't want the neighbors to be ridiculing me. I, I, I don't want to go there. God made it really clear in his instruction that when that judgment of death came through the land, the houses where the blood was applied, that judgment passed over them. It's also really clear when we read it that those houses where the blood was not applied, that the judgment hit that household. And we're not told specifically, but I wonder how many households of the Hebrews failed to follow God's instruction failed to apply the blood and realize the judgment of God. And the firstborn in those households were killed. You know, really, when we look at it that way, we understand that this was an act of faith. When God called them to apply that blood, it was an act of faith. There were many things about this, this ritual that they didn't understand. This was strange. They knew about sacrifice. They knew about special meals. But the application of blood was strange. It was unheard of. It was uncommon. It was new. Now, to be fair, and when we read this passage, we understand as we go on in verses 12 and 13 that God describes what's going to happen and why they need to do this. God doesn't always do that, by the way. Often when he instructs, he doesn't tell you the why or how it's all going to unfold. Here he does. In 12 and 13, he says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God told them what was going to happen, so they had every reason to believe him and every reason to follow through. And they'd seen God work in incredible ways. Remember, this is the tenth time that God had worked in miraculous ways bringing judgment upon the land of Egypt, and they had experienced that. But, you know, even in that, I wonder if some of those who hesitated tried to reason this out to say, you know, we were spared from some of those plagues. The cattle, when all the cattle died, their cattle didn't die. I think it was the flies that didn't affect the, the land of Egypt. Some of those plagues we um, didn't affect the land of the Hebrews. Some of those plagues didn't touch them. And, and I wonder if, if they just applied that reasoning to say, well, surely God wouldn't strike us. Certainly God wouldn't be that kind of God who would afflict that judgment on us. So we'll just do it the way we seem, the way it seems best to us, the way we think it should happen, and they didn't apply the blood. It really was a step of faith on their part, that they had to take God at his word, and they had to act even as strange as it was. But you know, when we think about that, it really drives to this point was true of, of the Hebrews in Egypt. And I think it's true for us too. They had to believe the fact that judgment was coming. And if you don't believe the reality of judgment, then the application of blood is ridiculous. They didn't believe God would really bring judgment upon them. Then it was ridiculous to think about applying blood to their home. Why would you do that? Certainly God didn't and if you didn't believe that reality, then it didn't make any sense. Well, that really is the backdrop for everything that we see moving ahead in the Gospel of John. That was the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb of God. You know, as we would jump ahead at this moment to even back to chapter 13 and that phrase that we see in the opening verse of chapter 13. Now, before the Passover... Jesus, knowing that his hour had come. Stop there. His hour had come. Because when we think about the Passover, we realize that the Passover looked back 
at God's incredible provision for his people. It looked back at the fact that they were enslaved to sin and they couldn't do anything to free themselves from that sin. It looks back to the fact that there was a judgment pronounced upon the land, a judgment of death, and it was the application of the blood of the Lamb that saved them from that death that swept through the land. It looks back at God's miraculous provision for them. But at the same time, we understand that this Passover looks forward and anticipates Jesus. It anticipates this very moment that is beginning to unfold now in the Gospel of John. All of that, all of that history, all of those ceremonies that they've part participated in for years, look forward to and really was pointing to this moment. And so we read that verse in chapter 13 a little differently. Now, before the Passover, the Feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come. It was the Passover and it was time. It all points to Jesus, but it wasn't simply a wonderful coincidence. It was the truth that this was the unblemished one. The lamb without blemish one without sin. And there was only one who was without sin, and it was Jesus, who went to the cross for us. It's the one who dwelt with us. What, what was the point of taking it into the house for that season of time? Because it dwelt with them. What does John say early in his gospel record? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We, he dwelt with us and we began to realize that this one is different. This one is different. And it's the Lamb that was set apart for this very purpose. And the Lamb whose blood was shed for us. And it was the, blood, the Lamb that set us free. It all points to Jesus. Not by amazing coincidence, but by the determined plan of so we, we, we said that if you don't believe the reality of judgment, then the application of blood is ridiculous. But we could say that another way. If you don't believe the reality of judgment, then none of the rest of this is wonderful. So if we talk about the unfolding of the events of the cross, as we talk about Jesus going to the cross for us, and his suffering, and his death, and his burial, and his resurrection, if we don't look at that with the backdrop of the certainty of judgment upon us, then this is not a wonderful story. In fact, it's a tragedy. But when we look at it from the backdrop of the reality of judgment, then we realize this is wonderful. This is God at work for us. And that's what we want to see as we continue in our gospel today. Today, um, I just want to give you this opportunity. If you've never embraced that Savior, You've never come to the realization that you're under a condemnation of sin and that there's a consequence for sin and the judgment is real. And if you've never cried out and said, God, let the blood of the Lamb be counted for me, let the blood of Jesus be the, the payment for my sin, then this would be a good day to do that. And I would love to pray with you and show you how you can know Jesus as your Savior and make this story wonderful. If that's the desire of your heart, come and talk to me. Come and talk to Mark. Grab somebody and say, I need to know that Jesus. Father, we thank you for this time together. What a great day of celebrating today. We thank you for the cross. Even though it's often inconvenient for us, sometimes it's even in the way. But we thank you for what was accomplished we thank you that the Lamb of God suffered for us. And when we think about that, we rejoice all the more because you loved us that much. Father, we would pray that you dismiss us from this place with blessing and that you would give us opportunity to share that message of hope with a world that's trying to fill up with things that don't satisfy. We love you, Father.